When you look at the manager's job, essentially what is the, the, the key function of a public manager? Well, it's a lot of things. Uh, Professor Ports and I have tried to deal with this in the textbook that you're using, but um, you've got to be a leader, and that requires vision, it requires tenacity, it requires passion, it requires uh, so many of these skills. You've also got to manage effectively. You've got to be able to pick good people. I mean, they're absolutely crucial to success. You've got to be able to motivate these folks. Uh, you've got to be supportive, but at the same time, you've got to be demanding in the best sense of the word. You know, I get heartburn these days watching these construction projects around the state and around the country, taking us forever to do things. Um, there's a failure of construction management there. There's no excuse for this. I understand we have environmental impact statements there. I'm all for that kind of thing. But we had it when I was governor. It didn't take us eight years to extend the Green Line four miles from Somerville. I mean, this is just absurd. So, so it's a combination of leadership and management. And um, so in the first couple of sessions of the course, what we try to do is take a look at a couple of managers, specifically the guy that was my revenue commissioner, uh, a guy named Ira Jackson, who, as I often said, uh, probably couldn't balance his own checkbooks, but was a superb revenue commissioner. And then um, the first EPA administrator, a Republican, a classmate of mine at law school, who um, not only in effect created the agency, that has put it together after the president submitted his ex executive reorganization plan, but I think everybody agrees, uh, Republicans and Democrats alike, that, uh, that he was Bill Ruckel's house was, was exactly the right person to create that agency and begin to make it a very effective force in American society. And, uh, and so looking at both of these guys, both of whom have a lot of common characteristics, um, they're optimists. You've got to be an optimist. Not a cockeyed optimist, but you've got to be an optimist. If you don't think that good people working together can make a difference, uh, in people's lives, then you're in the wrong business. Try something else. Um, there are people who had an eye for talent and surrounded themselves with excellent people. Um, they had people, they, they had good political skills. Uh, they understood the importance of the media. Both of them. I mean, Jackson was extraordinary, but he had himself an excellent communications director. And remember, in a system where we expect people voluntarily to pay their taxes, um, the media can play an enormously important role. Jackson understood that. Ruckelshaus did too. Um, and it wasn't an accident that Ruckelshaus decided to go after big polluters, both public and corporate, yeah. without an awful lot of consensus building, by the way, kind of violating the Dukakis rule. But in this case, why? Because he had a real credibility problem. His president had a credibility problem. Was Nixon really on the level when it came to environmental protection? Well, he had filed the organization plan. He, you know, it was his initiative. But there was always this skepticism because he had a big business community. Would he, would he tolerate going after this? And, and so Ruckelshaus, using the press very effectively, in two weeks, first hit a bunch of polluting cities yeah. right between the eyes and then hit the major corporate polluters of the country right between the eyes. Did he use the press? I'll say. And, uh, and so understanding that, managing your media relations and your media campaigns is an essential part of this. Well, in looking at both Jackson and Ruckelshaus, we're looking at a couple of very talented public managers. Uh, and they, they loved the challenge. Ruckelshaus at one point in the case says, uh, when do you get an opportunity like this? I mean, it doesn't come along once in every 15 years to be in on the beginning of an agency at a time when environmental concerns are beginning to explode around the country. I mean, what an opportunity. Um, neither one of these guys seem to be reluctant to take on this responsibility. And those are, those are some of the character. I mean, if you don't, if you don't respond to the challenge, and uh, if it isn't something that really gets your nerves tingling and, and your blood cooking, then you're in the wrong business. Yeah. So it, during that week too, you also I, I remember you sharing a little bit about maybe uh, you know something that happened here in the state as it relates to uh, I think you were talking about uh, some underwater uh, uh, you were dealing with I guess when you first came into into your governorship in the aquifer yeah the aquifer. okay exactly yes sir 
Well, the, the, what we discovered down on Cape Cod was that uh, the underground aquifer, which is a fancy word for an underground river, mm -hmm. and we have them all over the place, which is the principal source of supply for water on the Cape, was contaminated because uh, the folks up at o Otis Air Force Base, you know, back when people took the stuff and just chucked it, uh, had done so. I mean, very much the same kind of uh, thing we had in Woburn with uh, those kids dying of leukemia and uh, produced a book and a movie. Um, but in, in that particular case, there was this plume of oil that was starting to move down this aquifer from the Upper Cape all the way down to Provincetown. And uh, it was because in those days we just didn't understand what this kind of stuff, once it percolated down into the underground water supply, could do. So. Uh, it was a real problem, but who called it to our attention? Um, a math teacher at Cape Cod Community College who was a colossal pain in the neck, but let me tell you, you need colossal pains in the neck like that guy. <laughs> because uh, all of our public health people said, well, we've studied it and we don't see any connection and so forth and so on. Just like those mothers that I met with in Woburn, looking me in the eye and saying, uh, you know, the experts tell us that the kind of stuff that was being tossed out the window in those tanneries back in the old days, in Wuhan, which was a leather tannery mm -hmm. center, uh, couldn't possibly have caused our kids leukemia. Well, it turned out it had and it did. So um, one other important characteristic of a good manager, which we deal with when we get to the question of communities and advocacy groups and how you deal with these folks, is, is being an excellent listener. You've got to listen to these people. It's their neighborhood, it's their community. Sometimes they know things you don't know. And it isn't that you don't want to bring in experts. Obviously you do, but listening, reflecting, and taking that kind of thing seriously is very, very important.